Okay. <clears throat> so for this one, we're going to cheat just a little bit because we recognize that 72 is divisible by 9. So we knew that we could just break a 9 off as long as we knew what the other multiple was. When you divide 72 by 9, you get 8 as a result. So 8 times 9 equals 72. So we're going to leave our 9 on the top. On the bottom, we split it up into 8 times 9. Ah, this is actually a really good example. And what we do, we cancel the 9s, but we have to remember there's this tiny little 1 over here, right? So we cancel our 9s, yes, but there's also a 1 remaining on top, so it doesn't just turn into 0. So after we've canceled our 9s, we just write out what's left, and that is 1 eighth. Okay, moving on. All right, so addition and subtraction. <clears throat> um, so when we're adding and subtracting, there are two different uh, cases that we go through. One is the easy case when we have matching denominators. The other one is the slightly more difficult case when we have different denominators. <clears throat> um, basically, the easy case is outlined right here. It says that if you have the same denominators that you're working with, all you do is add the numerators and keep that denominator the same. Right? So remember that. When you're adding and subtracting, after you make the denominators match, they're just going to stay the same. All right, so let's go over a couple of these examples. So for this one, I have matching denominators, which means this is an easy example. So it's just 4 plus 5 over the denominator, 8. And that gives me 9 eighths. Ah, and, and so that was the easy example. We're not going to do a whole lot of those. They're pretty basic. Um, so now sometimes we run into something a little more difficult, right? Sometimes they ask us to add two fractions together, and we do not have matching denominators. <clears throat> so to add these, we got to manipulate them to make those denominators match, and then we add them together. Step-by-step uh, -step instructions for this is on page 24. It is something that you might, um, if you're... If you're one of the people who are kind of a little nervous about fractions, this is a page you're going to want to bookmark um, just because this is a process that we're going to be doing uh, probably 10 to 15 different times in different sections of this class. And so we're going to be matching denominators quite often. So this is definitely something you'll want to bookmark just so you can reference it uh, when you need it. So basically, to match denominators, I will first and oops, I'll just use this example down here. So 7 over 8 plus 5 over 12. It says step 1, find the prime factorization of each denominator. Okay, I can do that. I'm going to list them both on the side. I'm going to say here's 8 and here's 12. 8, we can build a factor tree for this, but I'll, I'll just let you guys know what it is. It's just 2 times 2 times 2. 12, 12 is just 4 times 3, right? 4 is just 2 times 2, so this is just 3 times 2 times 2. Okay, now step 2, it tells us to choose one factorization. I'm going to choose 12. Then it says, multiply this factorization, and I'm going to write it over here, 3 times 2 times 2. It says, multiply this factorization by any factors of the other denominator that it lacks. So this means any, any number of factors that the other denominator that it lacks, that means numbers 2, right? And so this has three 2s in 8. We only have 2 in our selected denominator, so we have to multiply one more. That is our LCD. So it's a weird process. We're going to be going over it many more times. Uh, don't worry if, it's, <laughs> if it seems just like you don't want to pay attention to it, but we're going to be going over that a lot more times, <clears throat> okay? So that's a weird one. Uh, so after we're done with that, let's see now, might as well just finish this out. So now it asks us to, um, <laughs> now we're going to, my, I might be jumping ahead of myself on this, but we're just going to do this problem. Um, so now that we know our common denominator, 
and that is 8 times 3, which is 24. We are going to rewrite our problem, 7 over 8 plus 5 over 12. And then we're going to multiply top and bottom of each fraction by any factors that it lacks from our common denominator. Right? And so our denominator on this first term is 8. 8 is equal to 2 times 2 times 2. We are missing the 3. So we multiply top and bottom of this by 3. With the other one, we have a 12, which is equal to 3 times 2 times 2, but we're missing that final 2. So we multiply top and bottom by that 2. And notice, we haven't changed the value of either of these fractions. We've essentially just multiplied them both by 1. <clears throat> so now we go ahead and give our results here. So we had 7 times 3 over here. That gives us 21 over 8 times 3, which is 24. Then we have 5 times 2, which gives us 10, over 12 times 2, which gives us 24. So now we have matching denominators. This is the easy case, finally. And we just add our numerators and leave our denominator the same. 21 plus 10 is 31, and the denominator stays as 24. <clears throat> Any questions on that? Okay. Don't worry if it's a little bit weird or uncomfortable. It's we're going to be doing a lot of those. <clears throat> okay. So uh, yeah. Um, so I would like to see one, at least one intermediate step on your homework, especially with problems like this. Um, you know, this is a great way to show it, is, is doing these little things, but if you've got a different way to show that you kind of knew the operation, uh, that's what's important, is that middle step where you do something from the operation. Yeah. Okay. Moving on, moving on. Um, We'll skip that for now. All right, so now we're on to 1.4, where we start talking about number classes. Um, number classes are pretty handy. Uh, the handout I gave you actually has some illustrations of number classes. Um, in math, we have a lot of different number classes, and they're really helpful because when you prove something in math, a lot of times you prove it for a single number class. And so they'll prove something for all natural numbers. And so you'll say, if you're, if you're dealing with natural numbers, these are the rules. If you're dealing with um, imaginary numbers, there's a whole different set of rules. And so a lot of times that's what they use these number sets to do, is to sort of differentiate the way they all behave. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and start with sort of the most basic number class. That is the set of whole numbers. <clears throat> the set of whole numbers is the natural numbers, and it includes zero. It can be written like this. Um, this thing that you're looking at right here, if you've never seen this, this is called set notation. And basically, it, it, set notation is just a set of numbers, and they, it means it's a set when you put it in between these two little curly braces. <clears throat> All right, uh, another important set of numbers are the integers. Uh, the integers are all of the negative counting numbers plus the whole numbers. And so the negative counting numbers like negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. And so the integers, they go all the way from negative infinity past 0 to positive infinity. Okay, things that are integers. I have five oranges. That's an integer. I have 22 siblings. That's an integer and a lot of siblings. My current net worth, including debt, is negative $5,000. That's an integer, right? But if you paid $22.50 for breakfast, that's not an integer, right? Because that's not a whole number. That's, a, that's got a decimal place on it. If you ate three quarters of an apple, that is not an integer, okay? <clears throat> Fractions are not integers unless... It's one of these, right? That's an integer. That's the only kind of fraction that's an integer. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, we represent these integers by making dots on a number line. That's one of the ways we represent them. Um, so, you know, like a visual representation of all the integers could be this number line here, where this side of the number line continued going on into negative infinity, and this side of the number line continued on going into positive infinity. And we have zero right here in the middle. So suppose we wanted to graph a number on this line. <laughs> Whoops, I sort of already have it graphed. <laughs> Just pretend that wasn't there. Um, so suppose we, suppose we wanted to graph the number 4 on this number line. All we need to do is we need to find the number 4, which is right here, and make a dot on it. I don't even know why I erased that. <laughs> <laughs> That's really it. That's the secret to finding number four. Now, if I ask you to graph the number four on a number line in your homework, you don't have to create this big expansive graph every time. Uh, you can do kind of like um, a truncated version of this. So you can just make your number line. I'd like you to mark where zero is. And then just mark, uh, you, can, you could say one, two, three, four if you wanted to. That would be a good way to do it. You know, if it was a really high number, if they asked you to count to 100, you might want to mark like 50 in between or something. But I don't need you to fill out this entire number line every single time you graph a number. That's a waste of your time. Uh, just do something basic so that I know that you get the concept. Okay. Onward. Now let's talk about rational numbers. Rational numbers are everywhere. Um, <clears throat> basically, rational means that they can be represented as a ratio. Hence the, the big word ratio in rational. That basically means any number that can be rec represented as a fraction of integers is called a rational number. This is the official definition of rational numbers for which they use a little bit of set builder notation that we're going to learn more about later, but I'll just sort of explain to you what, what this stuff means. Um, this is called set builder notation right here. It's got the curly brackets on the side and it's got a single vertical line that goes through it. Set builder notation basically says um, state your variable in question in the first part, so this A over B. The vertical line means such that and then state the property of that variable that fits into the set. And so this says a over b such that, this vertical line, a and b are integers and b is not equal to zero. That's the same thing as writing the set of rational numbers. Um, don't worry too much about that. It's not as big of a deal. <clears throat> um, something important or kind of interesting to note for these numbers is that they, you know, I mean, these are really nested sets. And so you can see on the handout that I gave you, it shows you how they're nested sets kind of down here in this uh, diagram, sort of Venn diagram looking thing. Uh, the natural numbers are all the way on the inside because those are one to infinity, right? But the natural numbers are complete, completely contained in the whole numbers because the whole numbers are just that plus zero. Uh, the integers expands a little more and a little more and a little more. So basically, all the natural numbers belong to the rational numbers, right? Because any natural number, you can just draw one underneath it and turn it into a fraction. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> that. There we go. Okay. So we just went over rational numbers. That's a very large set of numbers. Um, and the rational numbers, along with one other set of numbers, creates all of our real numbers. Um, in a little bit, we're going to go over all of the numbers that are not rational. Um, but first, let's talk about graphing a little bit. Um, so let's do a couple of graphing exercises real quick here, just so that you guys know kind of how to do your homework. <clears throat> Uh, in your homework, they ask you to graph stuff on a single number line. Basically, we just do what I did earlier. Uh, you know, I just like you to mark zero. Uh, figure out what the decimal approximations of these things are. And so if I want to graph five halves, uh, the decimal approximation of that, I think, is two and a half. And then negative 3.2, that's already in a decimal approximation. 
And then we have 11 eighths, which is 1.375. So if I wanted to graph these three numbers on a single line, first I start with zero, and then I just kind of, I can make my, uh, my integer points. So I'll say one, two, three, one, two, three. This is negative three, negative two, negative one, one, two, three. And then I go ahead and I make it a mark wherever uh, these points lie. So 2.5, I'm just gonna estimate 2.5. And then I'm gonna mark it if it's not already. Negative 3.2, well that's just a little bit past negative three. I'll put that right there. And then 1.375, eh, that's about a third of the way in between one and two. I'm gonna put that right about there. So that's really all you need to do to graph those in your homework. <laughs> Sorry about how scattered this stuff kind of is in the first couple of chapters. It's like we bounce back between like number definitions, fractions, and then like, yeah, it can get a little disconnected. <clears throat> um, okay. Oh, is this where they want me to do long division? I think it is. <laughs> so uh, in these next examples, they're going to ask us to convert these to decimal notation. Um, you know, like I don't, you don't have to do long division in this class, except for with polynomials later on. Um, and so, you know, if they ask you to do long division on, on on this in the homework, I don't really care if you just punch it in your calculator. Um, like I said, it's not an arithmetic class. Um, that being said, knowing your long division rules will help you out a little bit later on because we do long division on big equations instead of just numbers. Um, so you know, it's not too bad to practice, but. We're not going to use it too much, and I'm not going to make you show the steps on any of this. Um, <clears throat> so basically, let's see now. Uh, if I remember how to do the long division, <laughs> it's so weird. I went to a, um, I went to a grade school when I was learning mathematics, and I was in a lot of high level math classes, and they asked me to show the kids how to do uh, division. <laughs> I didn't know how to do it. I was like, ah. Uh, we don't do arithmetic, like we do like calculus and stuff. <laughs> and they're like, you don't know how to do long division? Like, no, sorry. <laughs> yeah, everybody's got a calculator, you know, and so, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Now. Um, so to do the long division on here, um, I put my denominator out front, and then I put my numerator under the brackets. Um, and so the first thing I do is I see if I can find a number that when I multiply it by 8, I get 5. Obviously, there's uh, not really a number besides a decimal that we can do that with, right? And I'm looking for a whole number. So we sort of skip to the next, we skip to the next step, basically. We put a 0 here because there's nothing there. And then we say, well, can we multiply 8 into 50? Well, it doesn't multiply evenly, um, but the next closest thing it multiplies to is 48. 8 times 6 is 48, so we just try that. So this is a 6. Now I take that 6, I multiply it back in to my denominator, uh, and that gives me a... Mm -hmm, oops. <laughs> Let's see now. So when I multiply the 6 in there, that gives me a 48, right? <laughs> Oh, I don't? I just use it as a 48? <laughs> See, this is how awful of them. <laughs> I, I remember. That's right. <laughs> Please don't drop this class after this, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and so um, so just like you said, we uh, we subtract the 48 from the 50, and we just get the two, right? And then a zero drops down, I believe. Um, yeah, and then we repeat this process over. We say, what do we multiply eight by in order to get 20? Uh, nothing, but we can get to 16. So we put a two here. Then we multiply the two back into the eight to give us 16, and then. 
that gives us a, yeah, that gives us four left over, and we get a zero. And finally, eight multiplies into 45 times, so we're done with that. <laughs> if you guys can't tell, that's the only time every semester that I do long division. <laughs> All right, uh, they've asked me to convert this one to decimal notation as well. I'm going to use the most handy tool that I ever had, um, and this is the calculator. So if you punch this into the calculator, you'll see that this gives you 0.63636363. That, that, we call that 63 repeating. And the way that you enter that in, or the way that you write that down, right? and so what it gave me was 0.6363. 6, 3, and then that just repeats forever. Uh, the way that you write that in a, an efficient notation is you write 0.63 bar, and the bar goes over the part that repeats. Okay. <clears throat> now let's talk about irrationals. Irrationals are pretty interesting. So um, rational numbers are ratios of integers. Uh, when we place rational numbers into decimal form, all rational numbers have a certain behavior. They either terminate, like 3 over 4 here, it terminates at 0.75, or they repeat infinitely. And so 1 third here, that repeats infinitely, the number 3. Uh, 22 over 13, we can't really tell what it is that's repeating infinitely in here, but it definitely does. Oh, actually, no, this one just terminates. Um, so that's the that's one of the properties of all rational numbers. They either repeat or they terminate. There's another group of numbers that uh, we're going to study, and this is the irrational number. The, the irrational number cannot be represented as a ratio of two integers. Um, really interesting thing about irrational numbers is that their decimal places never terminate or repeat. And so it's a unique string of numbers that goes on till infinity, which is very strange. And, and I might do a little demonstration on that at the end of class if we have time. <clears throat> um, and, and really it's one of the more interesting things in mathematics, a number that never repeats and it never terminates. What does that mean theoretically? That means that eventually any string of numbers that you can think of will be contained in that because it repeats infinitely, right? So every combination of numbers that you could ever imagine will be contained in a rational number. The decimals of pi, right? We usually know it as 3.14, but really it goes on infinitely. And so everyone in this room, your specific birth date, is contained in the number pi somewhere in order. Just the way it works. That's the way infinity works, actually. Furthermore, <laughs> this is one of my favorite theorems. It's called the infinite monkey theorem. The infinite monkey theorem poses that if you put a monkey in a room with a typewriter for an infinite amount of time and let him punch in random things on the keyboard, as long as they were truly random, eventually he would type out in order the full works of Shakespeare. Think about this for a moment. So if you have a monkey in a room and he's, he's completely typing random letters, right? There are 26. The probability that he types the first letter of your first name the first time is 1 in 26. The probability that he types the second letter of your name is still 1 in 26, and that builds up. But that's the thing. The probability might be extremely low that he even types your name, but with an infinite amount of chances, low numbers don't really matter anymore. And so that's the infinite monkey theorem. One of my favorites. <clears throat> okay, so um, good examples of irrational numbers are the famous pi, square root of 2, one of the first numbers that were, was ever proven to be irrational, square root of 3. Um, and given what I just told you, it should be obvious that it's actually impossible to write out the decimal form of an irrational number. It is not physically possible for us to do. All we can do is estimate it because it keeps going, right? Even if you had uh, an infinite amount of time, it just keeps going. <clears throat> okay. Um, so that being said, let's talk about 
<laughs> we're going to go on a quick tangent. Um, and this tangent is about the difference between pure mathematics and applied mathematics. <clears throat> um, when we talk about irrational numbers, those are, those are, a lot of those are like a pure mathematical thing because they're theoretical. Right? Like if I tell you, um, if we're working on a job site and I'm like, hey, uh, the framing on this has to be three pi long, you're probably going to throw your hammer at me. Like nobody wants an irrational number, right? They want three quarters. They want one half, right? And so if something is pi, we just estimate it. Uh, so the difference between a pure mathematician and applied mathematician is that pure mathematicians want everything in exact terms. <clears throat> And so, when we talk about uh, we talk about two pi r, if r was equal to four, pure mathematicians will leave it as eight pi because that looks pretty to us. I like that. It's all compact. It just says pi. I don't have to write out an infinite number of decimal places, and there's zero error. Zero. <laughs> However, an applied mathematician needs to use that, <laughs> and he's not going to use eight pi. Doesn't matter how much I want them to, there's no tape measure, this is pi on it. Uh, so, an applied mathematician will often take 8 pi and do an estimate to a certain number of decimal places. So, that's just a quick tangent about pure and applied mathematicians. Um, a lot of times, there is a, um, a friendly rivalry between the two. Um, applied mathematicians often say that pure mathematicians don't actually do anything, um, which I disagree. We entertain ourselves. <laughs> um, I am very much a pure mathematician. I love pure math. Uh, if you give me formulas, I am happy. If you give me an application problem, I am not. Uh, so that's just a quick kind of uh, glimpse into math, which I like to do in this class a little bit. I like to give tangents and stuff. So. <clears throat> Now, let's go back to reality. Suppose we wanted to graph the number root 3 on a number line. <laughs> this is actually more like an application because I'm just going to estimate that. So if I wanted to do that, first I need to come up with a decimal approximation for root 3. To do that, I'm going to punch it in my calculator. Um, if you guys haven't figured out how to use the square root function on your calculator yet, definitely figure out how to do that because it's very helpful. Um, and if you use your phone as a calculator, be careful because you can't use that in the exams. And so, you know, like use a calculator that you're used to so that when you need to find the square root button, you'll know where it is. Because yeah, unfortunately I can't let the phones in the exams. <clears throat> so in my calculator, I have to hit the second button it's this little blue button up here, which lets me access the little blue numbers on the top. And I have a little blue square root sign that I hit. And then I punch in my three. Um, and actually, maybe I have a good example here on the calculator. Where is my calculator? There it is. Um, so for this particular calculator, I can see they have, it looks like the square root symbol right here. So I can type in, whoops, that's not a square root. What just happened there? Oh, so I type in three and I say, give me the square root of three, and there it is. Um, on my calculator, I have to type in the square root first. It's a little bit different sometimes, so just get used to it. Um, so for this particular one, that's a big number. And of course, it's only an approximation. Remember, these decimals keep going. Um, but root 3 is roughly equal to 1.73. Oh, and here's a good time to show you another new notation. There'll be a lot in this class. The equal sign that means roughly is this one. So with two little curved lines instead of straight lines. That means roughly. What's that? <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so now to graph this, I mark zero on my number line. I mark out any integers that are close to this number. So this is one, this is two. This number exists somewhere right in this little spot. Okay, so I say root three right here.
Okay, so, <clears throat> so now a quick note. Um, up until this point, we've seen a lot of radicals that are irrational, but don't, get, don't make the mistake of thinking that all radicals are irrational. A lot of radicals have even number answers. So, you know, like the square root of four is just two, and two is obviously not irrational. So don't, don't think that um, just because it's a root means it's rational. Okay. <clears throat> oh, that's right. I think we have time for a quick tangent. Another one, I guess. This is the most that we'll have. Uh, so there is this website. It's pretty interesting if it will open. So this website, uh, they calculate the, um, the value of pi, basically. And this website will locate your birth date or any six-digit number in the space of pi. So let me, real quick, pause the recorder so nobody... Okay, moving on. Oh, if somebody was out of class and just missed what happened in class, show up to class. Sorry, I was talking to them. <laughs> All right, so um, so now let's talk about the real numbers. Um, basically, the rational numbers along with the irrational numbers, all the numbers that we just talked about, we lump them all up in one set, we get the real numbers. The real numbers are the numbers that you're kind of used to dealing with. We talk about a number line. Before we talked about it in sort of integer terms, uh, a number line for us uh, can now represent all of the real numbers, even the irrational ones, as long as we label them. Um, basically, one way to define the real numbers is the set of real numbers equals the set of all numbers corresponding to the points on a number line. That's one way to define them. Alrighty. Um, I kind of ha had a handout with this same information on it, but on page 32 there is kind of a, a structure of how these numbers work, you know. Um, and, and in this class, you know, this, this chapter, I'll, I'll be honest, you know, you don't necessarily need to study your hearts out on the number types. It, de it does help to know the difference between rational and irrational, though. Those are two really important ones. Um, but as far as like the difference between whole numbers and um, natural numbers, that's not quite as big of a deal. <laughs> that being said, let's do some of those. Um, <clears throat> so let's go ahead and identify a few of these. Which of these numbers are whole numbers, integers, rational numbers, irrational numbers, and real numbers? So this first one, negative 38. Is this a whole number? No. So remember, I, I know, right? Now I, I always get people on that one. Um, we think it's a whole because there's no decimal. But remember, the whole numbers are only positives, and they go from 1 to infinity. The integers are the ones that include the negative numbers. So this is not a whole number. It is an integer. So we'll put b here. Is it a rational number? Can we write this as a fraction? Yeah, yeah, we could just write a 1 under it. Boom, fraction. So yeah, it's a rational number. Let's see. Uh, since it is a rational number, that means it can't be an irrational, so it's not D. Uh, and is it a real number? Yeah. Yeah, anything that we're going to be dealing with in this class is a real number. Okay, so now negative 8 fifths. Well, it's definitely not a whole number because it's, it's a clear fraction. It's not an integer, right? Because it's not, it's still a fraction. Integers are the counting numbers, negative and positive. Is it a rational number? Of course, it's obviously a rational number. It's just a ratio. So yeah, C, definitely, which means it's not D. It's not irrational. And is it real? Yeah, definitely. All right, the number zero. The definition of whole numbers does not allow for zero, so it's not a whole number. It is an integer, though. Zero is a rational number, because we can put it over one, which means it's not irrational, and it is real. All right, point three, repeating. 
Not a whole number, not an integer. Is it a rational number? Yes. It is. Why? <laughs> right. You can tell that it's a rational number because the three repeats, and that is a trait of rational numbers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so if I give you a decimal and you're like, how the heck would I know? If it ends or repeats, it's rational. So this one, yeah, it's rational. We'll say C. Um, <clears throat> irrational, no, real, yes. So this one. Square root of 30. Um, so this one's interesting. We haven't really learned the rules on whether or not to call this rational or irrational yet. Um, so uh, first of all, I'm just going to type in root 30 on my calculator. And I'm going to see that there is no even number that pops out. It is something weird. So root 30 is equal to some decimal number, which means it's not a whole number. And it's not an integer. Now, as to whether it's a rational or irrational, we're going to jump ahead just a little bit, and I'll, show, I'll tell you a trick. Um, not really a trick. <laughs> Basically, um, when you punch your uh, square roots in your calculator, if it does not give you a whole number answer or an integer answer, it's irrational. That's it. Square roots without uh, nice solutions are all irrational. That's kind of a rule of thumb. So this one, root 30, since it doesn't have a nice equivalent, we call that D irrational. And it's also E real. Um, so we have about 10 minutes, so I'm just going to move on from this stuff into our next thing that we are doing here. <clears throat> uh, okay, order. We talk about order on the number line. Uh, order is determined by where the number sits from left to right. Uh, any number that is less than another will be to the left. Right, And so I say two numbers on the number line, negative 4 and negative 1. If I want to know which one is the smallest, it is always the one to the left. That is how the order works on the number line. Right? And so as we go further left, numbers get smaller. As we go further right, numbers get larger. That's basically uh, the order of the number line. So notation-wise, this symbol means is less than, right? And so if I say 2 is less than 7, that means that 2 is to the left of 7 on the number line. Same thing with negative 4. If I say negative 4 is less than negative 1, that means negative 4 is left on the number line, okay? This is something that, that messes with people a little bit. Be careful. A lot of times people are tempted to say that negative 4 is larger than negative 1, right? But the numbers keep getting smaller, even though they look larger. Okay, this symbol means is greater than. And so if I say 5 is greater than 1, that means 5 is further to the right on the number line. If I say negative 10 is greater than negative 100, that means negative 10 is to the right of negative 100 on the number line. <clears throat> um, and I, I'm sure you guys know that these symbols can be swapped around, and so it's not always so clear-cut as to which means less than, which means greater than. Um, but I always refer you to the, uh, to the, old, the old saying that, yes, that this little thing, this little inequality sign is a little alligator with teeth, and he eats the bigger number. <laughs> That's my rendition of an alligator, I guess. Or maybe something more like that. There we go. <laughs> yeah, so so that's it. you could still go by that rule in this class. Even though we've known it since we were grade school, uh, we know it's a good rule because we still use it. Um, so for these examples, let's go ahead and just write greater than or less than, depending on uh, which applies where. So um, 2 is what to 9? Less than, good. What do I throw in here? Negative 3.45 is what to 1.32? Good, less than. What about this? 6 and negative 12. 6 is greater than negative 12. Negative 18 and 5. Sorry, negative 5. Less than, good. All right, 7 11ths and 5 eighths. I got to calculate this again because... <laughs> 
So 7 by 11 is repeating 6, 3, and um, oops, 5 divided by 8 is uh, 0.625. Yeah, so this one is greater than. <laughs> yeah, that's, that was a close one. <clears throat> um, so these sentences are called inequalities. Uh, the only kind of the, the other stipulation of the inequality is the less than or equal to which I'm sure you guys have seen this as well This looks exactly the same. It just has one straight line underneath it and this says that um, That it, it can be equal to as well uh, You know this means that this is an acceptable true sentence However, this is definitely not right. We could not write that and be correct. Okay, um, oh, this is a little bit goofy. Um, they want us to write a second inequality with the same meaning as this one. Uh, don't overthink this one. Um, you can just kind of swap things around. And so you can say, oh, uh, negative 3 on this side is greater than or equal to negative 11. I think you have one or two of those kind of problems in your homework. So you just kind of swap it around. Okay, moving on. I think we're going to finish up here. Absolute value. I love this one. So the absolute value of a number is its positive distance from zero on the number line. An absolute value is always positive. Okay. The notation for an absolute value looks like this. It's whatever that is in between two vertical lines and it's pronounced the absolute value of a. Okay, so how to find the absolute values? We just got to think about how far away from zero these are. And, and it's really easy once you realize what we're doing, but I'll just show it to you on a number line real quick. So if we want to find, like they ask us over here, the absolute value of negative three, right? We have zero, negative one, negative two, negative three. This is, the distance this is from zero is three units, right? It goes from three to two to one, to zero. Three units from zero. So the absolute value of negative three is positive three. Likewise, if we want to do 7.2, there's really nothing to do, right? Because 7.2 is exactly 7.2 units from zero. So this is just 7.2. Zero, that's zero units from zero, of course. Negative pi, well, they just want the positive version, right? So this is just equal to positive pi. In fact, to compute any absolute value, you just spit out the positive version of that number. And so if you're looking at a, the absolute value of a negative 600, it's positive 600. Uh, you know, and so nothing changes with positive numbers, but with negative numbers, you just get rid of the negative. That's all you got to do to calculate the absolute value. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So... <laughs> All right, any questions today? Okay, my apologies for a little bit of rambling. Uh, there's a lot of different stuff to go over in these first chapters, uh, and I get excited by all of it, so I do tangents too. Uh, so thank you for your patience today, and I look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. <laughs> I'll take it. I like history, but I don't like all the discussion Oh, yeah. Those could get tedious, right? Oh, yeah. I don't like I don't like Yeah, I always hated discussion boards. Get them. Um, and I also have 
you know, I have kind of like a semi graphing calculator loaner that if they don't have one in the library, you can go grab one. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no problem. What do you think of your classes so far? I like the in person ones better. Oh, yeah. But I feel like I would be scared in a writing class. Yeah, maybe. I just. The way I write personally does not go with the rules. Ah, okay. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow.